I think we start. Um, welcome everyone. Good afternoon to our talk about seven reasons why effective compliance management is only possible with a graph-based solutions. Um, my name is Axel Markner. I'm the founder and CEO of Structure, um, the application platform on top of Neo4j. And with me on stage are uh, Christian Zambikakis from Cabros Compliance Management and Julian Schibergis from um, Bernstein Group. And together, we'd like to show you um, what we did in the past few months and um, explain why it is a good idea to use graph technology if you want to build an effective man a solution for compliance and risk management. So I give the word to Christian. Hello, everybody. Uh, let me start with a simple, pretty private question. Did any one of you uh, do some money laundering in the last weeks privately and can explain to the group how it works? <laughs> any drug cartel members in the room? Nobody. Alternative question. Um, does anybody know this guy, Walter White? What did he do with the crystal meth money? Where did he spend it? Does anybody know? What did he do with all the cash he earned from his crystal meth business? Pardon? Business. Yeah, but what business exactly? Car wash. Car wash, exactly, perfect, thank you so much. So he really did a money laundering by the books. So if we look at um, how money laundering works, we'll normally talk about three stages. The first one is the placement of illegal or dirty cash into the legal financial system. Second stage, so-called layering, is where you disconnect the illegal source from the, from the money. So you get a receipt, uh, a contract, uh, some, some profits from a business, and then you reinvest it into the business cycle. So in Walter's example, so for those who don't know him, he's the main actor of Breaking Bad. So a chemistry teacher, brilliant math cook. So he takes the math, um, all the cash from the math, puts it into his own car wash, through the books, pulls out the money from the profits, and invests and buys himself a nice Ford Mustang. If we're looking at the scale of money laundering globally, it's massive. We're talking about 2,000 billion US dollars annually across the globe, or 2 trillion US dollars. In the US alone, there, these are obviously estimates. We have 300 million, a billion, sorry, US dollars in the US alone, in Germany it's 100 billion, in the UK it's 350 billion pounds. It's a global phenomenon. Um, there's no country, no serious democracy in the world which is not trying to tightening the regulations around AML. Um, it's not only an economical problem. If you look at terrorism financing as part of money laundering, you know that's a society problem, a political problem, a security issue, and a reputational problem. Um, the impact on the business financially is quite heavy. So globally, two billion in fines were related to organizational AML failures last year. Um, this is the company side of things, but it's always a management liability as well. So chief executives and C-level uh, decision makers are personally liable if they do failures or uh, have failures in their own company. Um, the integrity of the company is uh, damaged. The entire business may be disrupted. As I brought three examples, um, one from the US, ING, one from Australia, and one from the UK. And you see the size of the financial fines are massive. Um, so who's affected? Historically, the finance sector and the banking sector, they know the problem. They have a lot of compliance uh, departments working on this, but as well, and this is what we're focusing on, is the non-financial sector. So as well, companies with a multi-layered, de decentralized structure, those that have a huge customer base, those working in a franchise system, those working across borders. Um, we have a special focus in the gambling industry, so those that are operating these so-called high-risk industries. This could be gambling, could be as well real estate, or those who trade with valuable goods, car dealers, jewelries, or arts. 
In a nutshell, money laundering is a hot topic because we're talking about personal liabilities on the management levels. We're talking about financial damages. You've heard millions and billions in fines for the companies. It's a massive reputational damage for a company, so-called naming and shaming. You don't want to be the company where the drug cartel or the terrorists were financing their next attack. It's a massive problem, as well for the politics. So authorities and governments have to explain themselves why so much money is fly floating around in shadow industries. We have a focus of the authorities. There's a massive pressure for success here. And in the end, the increasing regulations. Just an example from the EU, every year there's a new regulation where all the EU countries have to comply with. It's quite heavy and goes more into transparency. So who's Cabras to finalize this one quickly? We're a pretty young company, 10 months old. We are a compliance company with a strong focus on anti-money laundering. So far, within the first 10 months, we are representing 500 shops, mainly in continental Europe. We're targeting further 250 by the end of the year, and for Q1 next year, we're looking at 1,000 point of sales we try to um, represent. What are we doing? We're a one-stop shop for everything compliance related. We do the risk analysis for the company. We establish an entire compliance organization into the company, so we outsource and re-implement. Uh, we put standards and policies out. Um, we provide AML officers, so it's pretty legal work as well. The problem is with the volume we are working in and with the regulations uh, our customers are facing, there's no way we can't, can do this without technology. So we have some tiny technology solutions we are providing, such as a whistleblowing system, an e-learning platform, but as well, we're working with graph technology. Um, one of the key challenges here is besides the transaction monitoring, you look at, if you look at the gambling industry, even in, in, in our country, on a game day, we have hundreds of thousands of transactions every day. Then you need to have a proper case management, something that Structure Neo4j is building up for us as well. And finally, you have this so-called know your customer process, uh, process. Most of you might know about it. Um, who's the business partner I'm working with actually? What do I know about them? Who's the ultimate beneficial owner behind it? We take this one out now for a second, and my colleague Julian will be talking about this, how we're approaching this with graph technology. Hi. Thanks, Christian. Um, well, let's imagine you are the regional manager of Los Polos Hermanos, and the nice gentleman, Mr. Walter White, comes to you and says, hey, I want to be part of your franchise. What do you do? You haven't watched Breaking Bad, you only receive you know, an application, a couple documents, and you have publicly available uh, information. Now, for those of you who listened to the keynote this morning, I think uh, Emil quoted the Professor Fowler who said, you know, if I want to tell you who's a smoker, then I don't want the information about this person, I want the information about his friends. And that's what we uh, also do at Cabros, and we call it our Know Your Customer Graph, or Know Your Franchisee Graph. And um, if you look at Okay, there's a point of, oh yeah, it works. Uh, look at the graph of Walter White. We can see a couple of things. He used to be a teacher. He used to be a shareholder, gray matter technologies, um, high tech business, I think was stem cell research. Um, but nowadays, uh, he's uh, mostly involved with two businesses, a car wash and also a fumigation service, Vamanos Pest. Now the car wash, he runs jointly with his wife. That looks normal. But if you look at the fumigation service, you see well, there are two of his business associates that are a little bit shady. You have Mr. Pinkman, who has a known criminal record, drug dealing, and you have Mr. Amantraut, um, who was a former police officer who left the force uh, on allegations of corruption, so there's media reports. So just by looking at this and no further information, you can tell, well, maybe I don't want to um, not go into business worldwide immediately. Well, we know that we don't, but um, uh, a, a potential uh, regional sales manager would not, um, but we would know how to trigger uh, uh, enhanced diligence uh, for sure. Now, let's take a look how this um, works in a more real life example. <laughs> um, what we do is usually we, 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 we build a graph. Um, we take information that we receive as part of the due diligence process. Um, we also use publicly uh, available information, so we, we get IDs, we get registry records, um, contact, uh, contracts like rental contracts. Um, we take all this data, um, we analyze it, you know, we look at who are the actors, the, the uh, companies, the people, locations. Um, 
And then we kind of collate that data, enrich it with media reports, some open source intelligence, um, and, and we build a graph. Um, in this hypothetical example, you have at the top here our franchisee, that will be our client, and you have here the Alpha LLC as a potential franchise partner. Now, in a traditional um, know your customer process, what do you need to look at? Uh, you need to identify and verify your partner. You need to uh, identify the ultimate beneficial owner, the so-called UBO, and um, you need to um, identify the sources of wealth, where is the money coming from, and do some background checks like PEP checks, sanction list checks, and everything. Now, in our example, uh, what we could do is, you know, get a business record for the LLC. You would see it has two shareholders, a majority shareholder, a minor min blah, minority shareholder. Um, the minority shareholder has below 25%, so that's the limit uh, under which I do not have to identify the person necessarily, or not, not fully. And I have a majority shareholder, Mr. John Doe, up here, who is also CEO. So I check them, I verify him, get his ID, um, and we can assume he has some legitimate sources of wealth, and we're fine, we're done. That's more or less the traditional process. Now, why do we build the graph? Because of the interesting part right here. Um, let's say this is a restaurant chain. Um, here are three locations, and we look at the location, look at the contracts, and we see, oh well, um, all locations lead to the same landlord um, down here, which is not unusual, that's as a common occurrence. What is not so common, that's what you only see in the graph, is that actually this landlord shares the company seat with the minority shareholder. And if you look further, we also see that the landlord is owned by a company who in turn is owned by the owner of the minority shareholder. So what we kind of see here is a very traditional way of doing some um, layering of the money. So you have your restaurants, there the money comes in, the illegal proceeds uh, are getting mixed up. And instead of you know, having high revenues for the, uh, for the restaurants, for the company, um, what you do is you kind of siphon all the profits, or at least a part of it, it must still seem legitimate, through overpriced rents out of the companies. Now, overpriced rents, we are in New York, I come from Berlin. In either city, I think overpriced rents are the norm. So that really isn't that suspicious. Um, and then you transfer the money via those companies to the ultimate actual beneficial owner, who's not John Doe, but actually Jane Doe. So for us, this, this process just gives us a fuller picture um, because when we analyze and rate, we just don't look at the, the potential partner itself, but we also look at his graph. Uh, we see, are there any interesting personnel in the second or third row, um, or are there businesses that are unrelated, um, but also are very cash intensive? So by that we can say, okay, this, the risk for this potential partner is higher, lower, and we have a fuller picture. Um, a fuller picture is not necessarily only important for the you know your customer process, but also for the risk, man risk management itself. Because um, we want to have that network, we want to see that network, because risks that are within that network, um, they don't necessarily stay with one node. Like if, oh, uh, yeah. Um, so if Mrs. Jane Doe is, uh, for, for instance, a known drug dealer, we want to know that because that risk can spread easily to actually the person that we are in direct contact with as a franchise organization, um, and we want to prevent that we are being, the same, uh, being named in the same um, breath as that person. Um, especially, uh, Christian talked a little bit about reputational risks. Reputational risks, they don't adhere to the same standards as uh, legal proceedings, as um, prosecutions. Um, well, because they are uh, reputational, and uh, we all know media articles get out quickly and the, the headline is a lot juicier. Um, when I write, uh, let's say it's a, uh, it's a restaurant chain, it's like Burger King, helps with money laundering, then when I say, well, Jane Doe is convicted of money laundering. So what you wanna do is, uh, with, especially with AML, you wanna look at the network, you wanna see where are my risks and how can I manage them. Risks them in themselves are not bad, but you have to, you have to deal with them. Um, Another thing we do a little bit differently is we um, don't draw only pretty lines, but for us it's very important that we document those lines. So most of our relationships, our edges between our nodes, they are actually hyper relationships where there's some kind of proof in the middle. Um, usually it's a document where I say, okay, I have a contract um, or I have an ID or I have a record um, that actually verifies 
this edge, this relationship. Because for us, it's important um, if law enforcement comes or if an audit comes, um, we need to prove that the graph we built and the, the risks we, we found or did not find um, was all that we could do at that particular moment, especially since most investigations or even audits, they come years after the fact. So whenever something today happens, I need to document today how a network looked, how a shareholder structure looked, because it will be investigated a year, two, or five years from now. And at that time, I need to show, okay, at this point in time, I knew what we were actually dealing with or did not. So what, what were our challenges? Um, I think some of them are pretty universal. The real world is a graph and it's messy. So we don't have, we are, don't have simple models. Um, our data structures are very complex. Um, they're always changing. Networks are changing. Um, shareholders are changing. So we need to account for that. Also in this kind of uh, field of work, we often see the, the unexpected. So more of the kind of creative business constructs you wouldn't usually use or find. So we have, to, we have to deal with that, we have to prepare for that. And um, also that obviously our, our work is framed very much by regulation and regula regulatory change also is a constant. Um, so we need to account for that. We need a, we need a flexible, um, um, yeah, fle a fl flexible system to actually uh, be able to deal with all of this. And I think at the um, left-hand side, what we see here is um, the network from one of our production servers. So they are very complex. We need the flexibility um, within the data model. We need them with, for changing the data model. Um, we also need to be auditable, so because it's compliance after all, so I can't just change everything. I also need to document it and make it comprehensible to a third party. Um, another important aspect is that we have a high complexity, um, as seen by those networks. So, and while I want this high complexity, obviously in my backend, because I want to analyze it, I kind of need to condense it down to a level where actually uh, users, um, clients, or um, regulatory bodies can actually work with it, because no one can actually see what's happening here. Um, so you need to have, you need kind of able to condense it down. And lastly, also we must be transparent because our results and their processes, they must be verifiable. Again, we're doing compliance. Um, I need to prove that I did a good job. So um, unsurprisingly, our main requirements is that we need to be able to store large amounts of complex network data efficiently, be able to query it efficiently, flexibly. Um, we need to be able to have a system that is uh, very adaptable um, so we can actually react to changes um, whether it be regulatory or otherwise. Again, we need to have a lot of complexity, but also be able to dial it down a bit because um, yes, we are an IT company, but a lot of our users are lawyers. They also need to understand it. They're not graph experts. Um, we also have to deal with complex security models because it's very sensitive data. Not everybody is supposed to see every bit of data. That is also a very important requirement to us. And lastly, I think, Providing secure storage and archiving, it's kind of logic because, well, I need to show for at least the last five years that I did my job correctly. And lastly, obviously, it needs to be easy to maintain. Why all of these requirements are a perfect fit for Neo4j and especially structure, I think this uh, Alex will elaborate upon. Thanks, Julian. Yeah, um, so now I have 10 minutes left to, um, to explain what Julian meant by that these two products are the, the perfect fit for it. Uh, so I could simply say we fulfill all these requirements and we can stop here. Um, but um, I have some more details to share. Um, first, technology decisions, always important because sometimes um, it's difficult to change that afterwards. Once you have imported lots of data, it's very difficult to change um, your most basic layer, your database. So we chose the best database for connected data, graph-shaped data, as we all, uh, just saw it here. And um, the decision is um, very simple because there's um, the, the, the best database, the best native, native database is Neo4j. And so we built, uh, it, it is built and, and, and designed for, for um, native data, for graph data. And no other database is optimized um, for this use case. And um, furthermore, it's stable and it's 
great for enterprise requirements. Um, now, what is structure here in this, in this game? So structure is the application platform that helps to connect the data to the front end, the users use, or the interfaces you import and export data with. <clears throat> As uh, Julian um, pointed out, we needed a high level of flexibility in almost any area that um, helped to uh, reshape the data model or make it, made it possible to reshape the data model at any time, at any, any given time, even at runtime. Because you cannot wait for development cycles, um, like a couple of uh, weeks or even months, to rebuild your application only because your network, sh shape of your network has changed or your regulatory requirements have changed. So the secret behind structure is that the entire definition of the application is also a graph and stored in the same, very same database in Neo4j. Um, and you can manage everything in a single integrated tool, which comes with um, lots of integrated and built-in functionality, like a schema editor, where you can change your data model according to the actual size of your data. And you can follow those changes very, very quickly. <clears throat> and it has some, some very handy components like an integrated content management system and a page builder um, and a document um, store and, and, and file storage and so on. And the latest addition to this platform is our flow engine with, uh, with a flow editor which is uh, managed through a flow editor. That allows you to define queries, processes, logic of almost any kind, decision trees, uh, check routines and so on in a graph interface or with a graph interface. <clears throat> so by dragging and dropping and connecting nodes and relationships, which is very natural if you're in the graph space, um, you create these checks um, my colleagues just talked about, like the UBO check, like the identity status check. And you can reuse these components, the, the result of these components, and connect it or use it as one node in a more in, in, in a different, different check routine. So um, this is the ultimate uh, tool to allow non-developers to create or maintain or manage logic, which is very important here to keep up with all these changes. So an effective graph solution only works if you can evolve as quickly as your legislation or your changes in your regular, not only in the legislation, but also the changes your users need in the, in the user interface. Because everything is non-uniform and inconsistent, um, you have to really keep track on that very quickly. Um, it comes with a broad spectrum of import, import and uh, export uh, interfaces. And because most of the functionality, the basic functionality is already built into that platform, it's very cost effective, which is very important if you want to scale. Um, and the solution has to scale from a single person business up to a, an enterprise or a large company. It has, of course, to be secure um, and, and meet a high standard of security. Um, yeah, so this uh, solution we built really supports domain experts in their daily work by giving them the, the tool they need to define the processes without need from us developers. And that's, I think, a major step in this industry uh, to really provide a tool that, that enables subject matter experts to do their work without being, um, without uh, having to rely on programmers. Well, coming to a conclusion, uh, it's a very complex area with uh, complex regulations. You need a smart software solution. Of course, it cannot be done without a software. Um, to know what a business or your customer means to you means that you have to know their graph. Um, by the way, we're using here the same technology as the journalists lists by the, uh, of the ICIJ used for the Panama Papers and Paradise Papers, West Africa uh, leaks. So it's, it's, it's kind of uh, natural to use this kind of technology in this area. 
And um, so the technical components here are the native graph database and a very flexible application platform. So here are the seven reasons uh, we promised to, to give you in the title. Um, money laundering happens in a graph. The world of money laundering is a graph. Um, that's obviously one important reason. The competition is also using them, like maybe it's not competition, but it's uh, maybe the, all the different um, sides of this uh, journalists and maybe even the, the people who uh, launder money, I don't know. Maybe they are also using graphs, we don't know, but uh, if they do, we can fight back using graph technology. Um, the regulatory requirements can be best uh, understood and, and also checked in the graph. Um, we have a transaction graph. If you connect um, the transactions, the financial transactions of the people and the, and the businesses too, um, there, there are nodes in the graph, then you get an even larger graph. The security system is also a graph. You have a hierarchy of, of groups and roles and people. So um, these are important reasons and technical components also have to be a graph-based solution like you need fast queries to do real-time uh, status reports. You don't want to calculate them overnight and redo them overnight again. If something changes in the graph, you want to have that in real time. That only, that, that's only possible in the graph database. Um, and to be flexible enough to keep track with all the, all the pressure coming from your users. They want maybe new tools every week. You have to store also the application components, the UI components in the graph. That's what we do in structure. And in the last step, um, manage the business logic as a graph, what we are doing here as well. So that was um, basically it. Just some announcements. Um, we just released our, our new version 3.0 um, yesterday. There's a Windows installer um, coming with it, so you can easily download and, and try it out. We have completely revamped our website. Um, yeah, question. Can you briefly describe what, what your platform does or what your application platform does? Um, maybe, maybe we can, um, we have a booth outside, just, right. just outside. Um, you will run into our, uh, my colleagues and we can explain you everything about the platform. Yeah, so if you want, want to follow us on Twitter, and it's just at structure, and um, the contacts are my uh, colleague Ines, she's also here in the audience, and Christian from, from Kerberos Compliance, and they will, ab will be able to uh, answer you any question. Oh. Any questions, if we have some time left? I don't know. Yeah? So, um, have you actually implemented transaction monitoring systems in banks, or is this a more KYC-based? Uh... Yeah. The question is, have, do we have implemented transaction monitoring for or in banks, or is it, is it uh, rather uh, KYC? So, KYC is a very important component, which is already in place, and we are currently, as we speak, adding transaction monitoring uh, and transaction um, case management to the solution. We yeah. have currently implemented the case management already within structure, within our application, and we are currently transitioning from uh, the previous transaction monitoring solution to implementing the actual in structure as well. More questions? Yeah. Yeah. How do you handle the, the time element? talked about you know, earlier how things change over time, like the structure that existed a year ago doesn't exist now. Yeah, very good question. Question was, how do we handle time management or changing things in the graph over time? Very good question. We had uh, <laughs> very fruitful and lengthy discussions about how to handle something like, it's not versioning, uh, because uh, it depends on the type of data in your graph. So what you can easily do is, if you have a new version of an ID document or something like that, or, or a contract, you can just add it to a, to a linear uh, version list. But, but if, for example, things change like uh, who is owner of a business, and, and this is more difficult, um, and we handle that by, I think we handle that best by creating new documents because for each new relationship, 
a new document as proof or as documentation is added to the graph and then we can make the, uh, we can, we can uh, add the information from when to when or un until when was this document the valid document and when the, s the situation, when has the situation changed? I, you can explain it much better, I think. Well, not from a technical point of view, but yeah, I think that was actually one of the bigger challenges and I think we forgot it up there, I'm sorry. Um, now what, what, what you actually do is, yes, we, we, we take the, a document like a shareholders list, um, we connect it between all the nodes, but what we also do is we create another um, relationship. If it's the first time we upload that uh, shareholders list for that particular company, um, uh, so we create another relationship for each of the shareholders uh, that is linked to the document as well. Um, that is then written on by each additional document. So documents are classified, so I know that if another a uh, document from the type of shareholder information is added to the graph. Um, it will, uh, yeah, write forth those relationships and is also added to those relationships as proof um, when these relationships ex existed. And obviously, uh, when a shareholder is not on any shareholders list anymore, then this relationship will be ended um, with a timestamp. So we have all the past uh, relationships. Uh, we can still query them, we can still see them. Um, but only also can also see the, the current ones. And we're also taking snapshots uh, at any time which is like required by an audit or if, if, if yeah, s someone feels to like document this situation at, uh, at a given point in time, then we cre create snapshots and they will be archived to, a, to a export it as a PDF and archived, including all the documents and most of the metadata, so including the relevant metadata which led to this result as documented on that report and that will be long-term archived. So this is also a historic, um, well, you, can pres you can preserve the history. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, uh, we basically, um, very simple, we, create a PDF version of the website. So the we one website in this application, for example, is an AML report, uh, parameterized, and it's created in real time, so it's a one second thing. And then we just take another second, like create a PDF document, and this is a snapshot. And then we create an archive, which contains the, that PDF and all the relevant information and documents which are connected to this report. Any more question? I don't know if we have more time for questions. Okay, any more question? So if you have more question, please outside, there's our sponsor booth. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions which are left. Thank you very Thank much you. for your attention. <clears throat>